Thank you everyone for joining us today to discuss the topic of the global impact of strategic investors. As Justin mentioned, I'm Andrea Lowe, Senior Director of Investments at Stellar Development Foundation. I lead strategy investments for our enterprise fund. I'm thrilled to be joined today with three panelists, all companies we've invested in this year. We're gonna take a deep dive to explore what it's like working with Stellar from an insider's perspective. So today we have Amar Shadi, CEO of Tribal Credit, Yanni Gianaros, maybe you can wave, a <laughs> CEO of Wire, and Shivani Sharaya, CEO of Tala. I'd love if each of you could briefly introduce you and your companies to the audience, starting with Amr. Hi, everyone. I'm Amr Shadi, CEO of Tribal. And uh, our mission at Tribal is to um, help emerging market SMEs compete and grow in a more and more global economy. And the way we do that is by providing them with a one-stop shop platform that gives them access to international local payment rails, give them access to corporate cards, uh, short-term financing, treasury services, all in a very rich um, interface and um, powered by a spend management uh, backend. Great, thank you. And then Yanni? Hey everyone, this is Yanni Gennaro, CEO and co-founder of Wire. Really, really excited to be here. Um, Wire provides banking, back office, regulatory infrastructure for developers to help them bring, uh, build the bridges to, from the fiat world into a, a crypto world. Um, and we're very, very excited to be working with some of the largest companies in the space and, and providing this sort of infrastructure to, to bring billions into the ecosystem. Great, thank you. And then lastly, Shivani. Hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm excited to be here today. Uh, Tala's mission is to enable financial agency for the global underserved. And so we're a global technology company that's building the first ever financial services hub that is designed specifically for the underserved consumer in emerging markets. Great, thank you. So we have a jam packed session today with a lot of questions. And so I'm gonna dive right in to discuss kind of the first section of our panel, which is really diving into the value of strategic investors. So each of you guys chose to raise money from a strategic investor. Um, and so I wanted to understand why you decided to do that and why in particular Stellar. I mean, I can, I can start as a, as a company that's not necessarily a crypto native. Um, we, you know, we'll label ourselves as a crypto crossover. Uh, it was very important. I mean, we, we built Tribal from day one with, with uh, crypto as being part of our, our strategy. And, uh, but we always had to kind of build that core business first. And for us, as we grew uh, Tribal and really kind of de-risked uh, the, 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 product, the product in the markets that we're after, uh, we, we then kind of, chapter two for us was enabling crypto and, uh, and really making that vision that we had from day one materialize. And there was no better way to, to do this, um, to accelerate that for us, uh, like having uh, a strategic investor like Stellar on board that just there's a lot of alignment in terms of the mission that we both have and we we felt that there's some um, mission alignment is, is one thing but also added value is is another so the way we saw stellar um from our early discussions was this is really an ecosystem builder this is not just a regular strategic investor it's really an ecosystem builder and we had to kind of accelerate that and be plugged into that ecosystem so that was really the highlight for us to um, to have a strategic investor and stellar on board interesting yeah and just to, to, uh, adding to to kind of those comments there i think that both wire and and stellar's missions are extremely aligned uh, we enable developers to uh, obtain this really, really ex expensive technology all over the world, right? Like the regulatory banking back office infrastructure, and it's quite expensive. And, um, you know, Stellar's mission is to create equitable um, uh, freedom for all, every single person in this, um, in, on the planet. And I believe that, you know, providing access to this sort of very expensive uh, technology that we provide to developers is very, very mission aligned. And, um, 
and so on the mission standpoint, I think that it was very aligned and, and uh, we spent a lot of time this year really working together and, and building into the anchor ecosystem and, and providing value, both uh, helping companies come to the U.S., but also obtaining different rails all over through all over the planet. So it's been it's been awesome having that um, alignment there. And I, I know both teams are are really excited about it. Great. And Shivani? I think for us, it was, I mean, it started definitely with the mission alignment. You know, I personally um, have been involved with Stellar for a long time and just, I think, respected, um, again, the ecosystem that Stellar is building, but also really realizing that there was so much that we could do together. And when, you know, Tala first started, we really focused on our first use case, which was access to capital. Um, and for the last six years, we really delivered that value proposition to our customers across our four markets of Philippines, Kenya, um, India, and um, Mexico. But then what we realized was that our vision is much bigger than that. It's much bigger than just providing access to capital. It's really, how can we help our customers really use that money, protect their money, as well as grow that money? And so what we realized was with Stellar, we could actually accelerate that vision. Um, and I think one, it's through the leadership and again, the team that Stellar has and the capabilities, but it's also really because of the other individuals even on this call. It's the, the anchor ecosystem that we really feel like we can bring our customers to their platforms and their products as well. And so I think the thing that appealed to us was one, we get the knowledge base and the expertise of the Stellar team, but we also get the different composition blocks and the companies that are part of the ecosystem. Great. So that leads me kind of to my next question around, obviously Stellar is a strategic investor. How is that different than working with like a financial VC? All of you have raised previous rounds to, to your latest rounds. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can jump in really quickly. Um, you know, on our end, um, it is very different. You know, we're really, I think the big thing here is that we get to co-create. Um, and that's so different than working with a traditional financial investor. Um, there's really this aspect of looking to the long term and thinking about essentially what can we be doing that is best for our customers. Um, so it's really about delivering added value to our customer base and thinking bigger and bolder. Um, and I think having Stellar now as part of our board enables us to actually push the other financial VCs as well to think even bigger. Um, so I think that's one is just operationally different, co-creating. And then I think the other piece is that specifically, you guys are a strategic investor that has that more innovative and future looking mindset, um, which again, I think is the big difference in terms of how we're trying to, to again, go you know, to Tala 2.0 as we're all talking about. It's going beyond what we initially started with. And so we need essentially a different strategic lens and voice on the board. And that's what I've been excited about. I love the term co-create. I'm a profuse note taker. So I was jotting that down as we spoke, uh, but thank you. Um, what about you, Amr? Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. I think uh, the difference uh, for us is, um, is very material. Maybe this is a little bit more tactical, but when we talk about you know, creating equitable uh, access to global financial um, systems, co-creating comes with with that uh, product management as well so I mean it's not just about building an ecosystem where you know you you would either do work directly with Stellar or or with the partners what we have seen different is Stellar has come with we'll connect you with, with this partner but we also have this uh, this team with us from Stellar on on the Slack channel. We are going to have a project plan together. We're going to put these milestones that we're going to achieve together. And obviously, these are things uh, that you don't have with your financial VC. I mean, this is really kind of you building building something together and being very hands on and just having these daily and weekly conversations. Um, so that's that's been very. Um, very exciting because then all the stuff that we put on paper and we agree to, and we say we want to do all of these things, um, there's actually a plan forward to getting them done. So, 
Dow, I'll, I'll team up to some of the comments that are already made. Uh, I think that me on a personal level, the operational excellence that Stellar has brought to our, our organization has been immense. And, and it's been very, very awesome and very, very uh, enlightening just working with the entire Stellar organization, both from uh, the leadership side all the way down to you know people working on the day to day pushing these plants forward. For us, I mean, you know, deepening our rails is really, really critical to providing uh, success for developers and reaching ma massive amounts of markets. And I think that putting a plan forward and working with uh, Stellar on that has been extremely powerful for our business. And, um, and, and yeah, it's, it, I can't imagine working with any other VC, any other strategic investor outside of Stellar on this, to be honest. And we're, we, we've seen a lot of success this year around that, uh, operationally, operationalizing that plan. That's so great to hear because I think sometimes there's this narrative around strategic investors and corporate VCs. And so I think we're just debunking those myths on this panel. Uh, but, but candidly, like what should CEOs consider if they're deciding to partner with a strategic investor? You guys mentioned a lot about Stellar in particular and how we may be different than financial VCs and even other strategics. But really curious about what's some advice for, for companies considering and does that differ for folks in the U.S. versus emerging markets? I can start with that one. Um, I, I can't speak too much on the emerging markets, um, still, but um, I can definitely speak on kind of like in the U.S. And I, I guess it could probably be generalized a little bit. I think you it, being mission aligned is very, very critical, right? So understanding upfront what is expected on the strategic and forward really, really critical, uh, you know, money's great. And, you know, it's definitely, you know, definitely come in, in times where uh, you need it, but like there's you, being mission aligned for the long term is very, very critical. And I think that um, that just, uh, you know, sets a precedence to the relationship if that, that that's all negotiated up front. Yanni, is that usually hard to find though, mission alignment? It is. We, we've taken some uh, strategic capital from other partners as well. And I think that the, some of those uh, in 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 concept, like banking partners, um, you know, it seems like it would, it could be really fruitful relationships. But um, they, you know, I guess another point is like having the operational aspect to it as well. Input, you know, project managers within the organization to push the 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 kind of the projects forward and and operationally lies in that strategic investment. Uh, we definitely have seen in kind of like other strategic investments that there wasn't really a cheerleader pushing or owning that sort of investment. Um, it's kind of, they set some money and then, you know, maybe they check in every six months, but it wasn't like kind of like the, the, the push and kind of like, we want to make this work uh, that we're seeing from Stellar, which is really impactful. Yeah, and maybe I can add, you know, the way we've been thinking about this is really around three main things, three questions when thinking about strategic investors, like what, what can they validate for us? What can they accelerate for us? And is the timing right? I think this has been our lens of thinking about uh, strategic investors, and um, and I think it just it applies to you know whether it's a blockchain or a non-blockchain investor. Okay, shifting to kind of the last question um, in in this topic. Um, about blockchain versus non-blockchain, there's record amounts of treasury sitting at both blockchain protocols and on corporate balance sheets. I saw a tally that 15 corporations have 1.1 trillion in cash reserves. And I think I saw a, a tally of just across seven blockchain projects, there was over 8 billion in equity and grants looking to be deployed. What do you think uh, is, is the role these types of strategic investors will play in the near future with, with so much ca cash on, on their balance sheets? Just a quick comment, a comment on that. Uh, I think that uh, over, over the next two years, you're gonna see a lot of M&A activity from pro on the protocol level. I think that the, a lot of this uh, cash is gonna get uh, deployed. You're gonna have a lot more teams, structures around these sort of or, or, or like a relationship with the capital and the treasury on the protocols, even on the Dow perspective, um, some Dow zone, you know, billions of dollars right now. And I think that you'll see an incredible amount of, of, uh, of kind of movement on that sort of front over the next two years. Uh, I think that the teams will be formed a lot more um, and, and it's gonna be a very interesting time period 
when we see that come through. I also think that, you know, I think maybe my optimism would say that I think it could be something that's a force for good. Um, you know, I think uh, like we're saying, or like Yanni is saying, you know, we're going to see a lot more activity in terms of m &A. Uh, We may see a lot more, again, consolidation, but what we could also end up seeing is a lot more innovation. Um, and so that's kind of my hope is that right now what we see in the space is a lot of it's all just in the developed markets. And I think all of us on this call are really talking about the bigger kind of global opportunity and the opportunity to build for the underserved customer. And so if there's a lot more capital in the space, um, potentially we should see more of a risk appetite and the ability for us to actually, again, think a little bit differently than um, you know, the current <laughs> play to earn space that we see in developed markets. Great. I'm gonna to shift to kind of the se second section of our panel, which is really diving a little bit deeper into what it's like building at the intersection of FinTech and crypto. This is all an intersection that you three are playing in. And every day we're seeing another headline of so-and-so bank hires head of crypto, so-and-so neobank hires head of DeFi. You guys have been working on this since this year, since the beginning. Um, so the theme of Meridian this year is build locally and impact globally. All three of your companies have offices in the US, but are building globally, as you, you guys mentioned. Wire is expanding into Latin America. Tribal Credit's largest market is Mexico. Tala has offices in Mexico, Kenya, India, and the Philippines. Can you talk a little bit about opportunities and challenges as it relates to building in this intersection and and also building globally. Yeah, maybe maybe just briefly for for us, the what we found very exciting is <clears throat> just the uh, in some of these emerging markets uh, that we're in. I mean, we're we're in LATAM, we're in fintech, we're doing SMBs, and then you add and all of this is very hot, and then you add crypto to it, and uh, <laughs> it becomes super like on fire. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what we've seen actually. Um, building in this intersection, and maybe it's kind of a slightly different uh, perspective of the, on this, but talent. I think we've been able to attract some of the best talent on both sides of the board. I mean, you said Mexico is, is, is one of our biggest markets. We, we ramped up maybe from uh, five people or three people to, um, to 100 people in just maybe uh, five, six months. In Mexico, the total team is 200. We have uh, we're around close to 20 people in the US today. And I can tell you, it's been, um, this intersection has been just attracting some of the best talent for us and people that are super excited about all of these things, um, especially on the crypto side. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I can't name some of the, the amazing folks that we've added um, just by adding this whole crypto component. I'll let the other, other uh, panelists, you know, other friends share a little bit more, but I just wanted to highlight uh, how exciting it is to uh, attract talent in this intersection. Yeah, just adding some comments there as well. Um, I think that, you know, we, so Wire has been uh, a business since 2013. We've uh, very, very dedicated to the kind of crypto ecosystem and pushing it forward. Um, and so we've been, you know, just like out of experience of building uh, payment rails all over the world, uh, for very many years and, and kind of like Wire started as a cross-border payments remittance company, hence Wire, uh, Global Wires, not, not much clever around, uh, 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 genuine around that. But um, there's, you know, we started build. we've always been kind of playing this like fiat world and crypto world. And we've been, you know, the, the, there's challenges in both, right? And connecting the two is definitely a very in, interesting intersection, right? The challenges on the on the pay, payment side of the world, like the regulatory, the infrastructure, the banking infrastructure, the compliance infrastructure, and it's different in every single country that you operate in. And then you have in the crypto world where you have to deal with all everything, well, pushing things on chain, the the technology infrastructure, but then the the massive component was uh, education, right? Uh, educating people. Uh, from the crypto world, how to operate in the fiat world and educating people in the fiat world operating in the crypto world, right? And uh, tell, you know, the story that you say in the payment world is, hey, it's really safe to be, you know, there's really good things happening in crypto. And the things that you say in the, the crypto world is like, mm -hmm. hey, we can make this work. So this interest, we've been playing this intersection for a very, very long time. 
I think we're really good at it. Uh, and I think that we built really, we try to make really easy APIs to kind of connect the two worlds. Uh, but there's, there, there's a lot of challenges with those, but the, I mean, that is ultimately the opportunity, right? There's a reason why it's so difficult. And there's a reason, you know, ultimately this is why we're here is because, you know, we want to make it easier and we want to kind of debunk a lot of that, that infrastructure. And um, hopefully we can migrate to a fully crypto world at one point, but there is going to be this, this period where we have to, there, there's going to be companies like ours that are going to be putting the ramps into those ecosystems. I would totally agree with what Yanni said. And I actually think, you know, I, I think something interesting for us all to think about is the fact that, you know, all three of our companies have actually delivered real value to our customers already. Um, and I think that's the biggest difference is that we actually have customers in emerging markets that are the underserved that actually trust our platforms. And so what, you know, what, you, what he's saying is totally right in that we have the real opportunity, I think, unlike others, to really now on-ramp these, this whole new set of consumers into the crypto world. Um, I also think what's really interesting is that for the first time, I think we can take it, really take advantage of potentially some of the in incentives that the crypto world offers, right? Whether we're talking about <clears throat> lower cost of capital for our companies, um, different forms of capital structures that we can take advantage of, or even yield that we can generate and pass back to our consumers. I think we never had those kinds of incentives before and that kind of flexibility. Um, you know, otherwise it was always marketing dollars, <laughs> right? Or um, thinking about how to subsidize it. But now there's real ways that for our companies, we can actually win in a much faster way and build faster. And then I think offer a lot more to our consumers. Um, so that gets me really excited. And then I think really similar to, to what's been shared, um, I do think it's our responsibility in some ways and an opportunity we can create, which is how do we work with regulators? to essentially almost like put out the regulation that we want, right? Um, because we understand this consumer better than anyone else in these markets. And so if we're looking to make things safer, more secure, more flexible for the consumer, um, you know, I think that this is an opportunity for us to really put out um, our own kind of thought leadership in this space. I love that. It sounds like all of us like playing in the messy middle of intersections, and that also draws other talent, also intrigued with this challenge, but that it, in the end, it's the opportunity. And so you guys touched a little bit on different concepts in both fintech, traditional finance, and crypto. And um, can you guys talk a little bit so the audience understands how your businesses are using crypto and how in particular you're using Stellar or plan to use Stellar? Happy to start there as well. Um, um, so we, we're, it's, it's very, um, so the integrating with the Stellar ecosystem and, um, and the, the various steps has been very, very, um, kind of fits right in, into our API infrastructure, right? So we use crypto rails in, in order to actually move value across borders, right? So, uh, you know, we're rolling into different liquidity pools that help us move value from point A, country A to country B. Uh, now, on a, we finally have a way where we can safely do that, right? Communicate to partners that are other anchors and be able to pass KYC information. So. That that API infrastructure and kind of like the technical integration on that has been very a one-to-one -one match with what we already do, right? And it's simplified this because every every time we want to go to a different anchor or a different or a different payment provider in a different country, we have to adhere to kind of a new set of APIs or a new set of like rules and regulations. But putting everyone on the same kind of protocol and and communicating through that protocol on the KYC requirements on the payment instructions has been extremely valuable because now you know we've deeply in, integrated with the uh, set 24 and we can now go into different anchors that also have that sort of fair protocols and easily onboard them into a uh, wires um, platform which is, is 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 extremely powerful and it's right in line with our vision of building different rails for developers Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Shivani. <laughs> um, on our end, um, it's actually looking at all of the different use cases that we're looking to enable for our customers. And so by integrating with Stellar, you know, we are able to, one, improve just cash in and cash out for our customers. 
um, overall across all of our markets because Stellar is integrated already with some of the providers that we already work with. Um, the second piece is enabling us to actually have crypto wallets that we can offer to our customers um, on the back end. So again, this is a way for us to bridge and earn their trust before they're actually, again, really fully integrated into the crypto ecosystem. Um, and then within that wallet, we can offer the different use cases of how do our customers receive their remittances? So how does money actually move cross-border for them? How can we save them more money and time? Um, how can we help them actually earn uh, yield on their savings, even if it's small dollar amounts? And then the last piece is really thinking about for Tala, how can we actually leverage it for our own business in terms of how we move money cross-border for our portfolio? Amr? Well, I was just gonna add, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we're working maybe on uh, five or six different ways where uh, crypto is adding value, but uh, you know we'll announce those one by one uh, during the coming over the coming uh, few months. But I would say generally the use of crypto for us has just been focused on driving a lot of value for our customers, whether it's making things cheaper and faster for them. Um, I think uh, Iani and Shivani have just touched upon uh, some of this. Uh, the other thing is just changing our cost structure, our unit economics as well. That's something that uh, that we're leveraging crypto for. So these two areas is kind of really the broad lines for for tribal on how we're using crypto. I love that. I think these are just real use cases of of a blockchain helping real businesses that have real users, and that's the story we continue to tell at Stellar and and with with folks like yourselves. Um, so shifting to kind of the last section before Q and A, wanted to talk about the future outlook of this messy intersection. <laughs> what are your long-term, well, I suppose we already talked a little bit about the long-term goals, but so I guess, Shivani, it, for you in particular, you are operating across four markets. What role will blockchain play in each of those markets? And, and is it different or, or, or this, a similar flavor? So for us, um, I mean, I would say that we look at things at a, uh, at a global basis when we think about the infrastructure that we're putting in across all of four of our markets. Um, I think that the, I think the unique capability that blockchain offers us though, is that we don't have to offer the same value proposition um, to each of our customer bases across our markets. And so in one particular market, um, our customers may have more demand for a savings product. Um, another market may have more demand for a payments product. And I think um, what blockchain offers us is that unique capability to actually to essentially like really customize our offerings across all of our wallets um, in each of these countries. Um, so it's, it's both enabling us to be global and very, very local at the same time. The theme of Meridian. Yeah. Amar, you are also um, working in multiple markets and ex expanding into multiple markets. What are, what are your thoughts about blockchain and is it the same or different across the markets? Um. <clears throat> I think we've we've been seeing the same, and what the way we the way we're looking at tribal as well is uh, we're adding uh, we're we're bringing kind of this use case for for crypto to to these different markets, but I think we're doing the opposite as well, which is we're also so solving crypto uh, problems, um, and when you look at some of some of the issues that exist today in the crypto world, especially in kind of the lending. Uh, on the lending side and generating yield, a lot of it is just based on over collateralization. Um, you cannot really sustain yields for a long, you know, for long periods. It's very susceptible to how, you know, whether we're in a bull or, or bear market. And what the way we see kind of the opportunity for value creation and um, and how how the different markets react is just creating and solving some of that over collateralization problem. We believe in um, under collateralization is going to, um, to start you know, creeping into crypto world. We talked to a number of VCs in that and investors in that space, and uh, they're really looking at, at under collateralized lending. So I think um, the opportunity in the, in, in the future towards under collateralized lending will, will increase. And I think it's very consistent across the markets that we're in, just by virtue of working with SMEs in 20, in 20 plus countries, it is a consistent problem and that's a good thing. Uh, it's, it's kind of one problem, you solve one, you solve for many. 
Great. Um, Yanni, you guys recently started doing more work in emerging markets, partly in partnership with Stellar. What is what is your outlook on, on kind of uh, emerging markets? Yeah, I mean, it, emerging markets, um, so just on, on, on a, you know, adding like the, the vision of blockchain in is on a global sense, right? So um, open networks speak closed networks day in, day out, right? I, I spent the past, close to the past decade of my life really pushing the vision of crypto and 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 blockchain ecosystems uh, to to the masses and you know here we have a technology in the same way that you know the internet democratized communication uh, we have blockchain democratizing financial access right and that is really you know if, if i'm a paypal user i cannot send money to square cash or if i'm a paypal user i can't send money to another network that's closed and and operated so the real vision of, of, of blockchain technologies is now we have an open source protocol that people in any single country can really build incredible applications to communicate with each other without without sort of having like the the, the push of like a, a single entity in, in kind of pushing that forward. And I think that that you know it, it's an evolution, right? And and bringing everyone to have um, financial access and, and it's all part, uh, part of for the course. So, um, you know, for us, we started with a few markets and, and how do we for, uh, connect to these few markets and how do we help developers build these sort of applications into these ecosystems and really uh, easy with e re really easy APIs. And I think that, you know, it's, it's part for the course for us to grow uh, to emerging markets and, and keep focusing on that and providing tools to developers to help them build lending applications, to help them build, you know, uh, crypto remittance applications, to help them build any sort of applications that will help them connect to, to a more equitable um, planet. Got it. And so I guess if you guys had to boil down to like, what is the biggest challenges your companies are going to face or continue to face in operating in this space, what would it be? I'm curious if it's the same or different. I think we'll probably all say regulatory in infrastructure is very is definitely uh, it, it, may, maybe not everyone, but I, I definitely think <laughs> speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> may, uh, I think that's definitely something you know, especially as you grow to different markets. It's definitely something that is a ever changing landscape, right? Uh, crypto is definitely getting uh, bigger and bigger every year, as expected, and um, I think that there are a lot more governments are looking into. It. We had the first government this year finally accept it as a legal tender, which is incredible. And you're going to, I think that, that that's going to, um, you know, you, you start seeing a lot more um, uh, regulatory infrastructure be, be of a more, most importance. And I think Shivani said that very, very earlier um, uh, where, you know, we have the opportunity here to really change that, the conversations with regulation. And I think that's absolutely true, right? We are shaping the story of tomorrow and, uh, and being in those conversations are really, really critical, especially and having the, the, the right infrastructure to do that is, is, is going to be very powerful over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Amar or Shivani, single um, biggest challenge yeah. operating this space? <laughs> I, I really think it is um, the dynamic regulatory environment for sure. But, you know, I think, I think um, as we were all talking about, it's like, you know, can we leverage the trust that we have with our customers already? Um, I think we all believe that we can do that. Um, it is still something that we need to see us all do at, you know, really truly global scale in terms of having, you know, hundreds of millions of underserved consumers, um, you know, within our, within our platforms um, and ecosystems. I think we still need to see if that can happen. Um, and, I think hopefully we we use the trust of the consumer to then build the trust with the regulator. Um, I think that will be the way for us to actually be able to show that, you know, we know what kind of regulation should exist. But, you know, I think a challenge is going to be for all of us to, to essentially be balancing what we want to build for our consumers while also working on the policy side, while also thinking about how we grow our own company's capital bases. And so... I think essentially it's like continuing to be at that intersection and straddling many worlds at once. Yeah, and, and it becomes a challenge as well with, um, when you look at, it's, it's so easy to say LATAM and it's so easy to say Africa, but uh, you know, people don't, uh, people probably realize, some people realize LATAM is, you know, all of these different 
uh, regulators and Africa is a whole bunch of other regulators and and just to having to have this discussion uh, in each market um, is 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 important and just understanding navigating that space in, in every single market is is important. Great. Well, we have a few minutes left for the audience to send in Q and A. So feel free to ask any questions um, to our panelists. They are at at the forefront of this intersection and the thought leaders actually building stuff at this very intersection. Um, while we kind of wait for some questions to pour in, I'm curious, um, what are your personal predictions for um, the, like, beyond like lending and remittance cases, like are there any of kind of the crazy use cases like the metaverse and NFTs that you believe will, will take off in emerging markets for next year? Uh, thoughts? Um, I'll, I'll go really quickly. I think one thing that I've been really curious about is thinking about um, within the meta universe, uh, metaverse, sorry, I, as we think about how we leverage communities. Um, and so I've been really interested in this concept of uh, sister cities and how um, Essentially, it's like you could have a, a city in Kenya that also has a sister city in the US. And, and so how can we think about kind of bridging the divide in that way um, and thinking about essentially um, how can, I don't know, maybe it's a little out there and optimistic, but how can cities actually care for each other, even if um, they're not essentially in the same place? I love that. Yeah, I, I think tying into kind of the, the concept of community, is we've seen this massive explosion of DAOs be generated in the past that have uh, in the past uh, couple of years, and I think that we're in the very much infancy phase of where DAOs have an extreme amount of money and um, and and, and and somewhat very disorganized. I think that over the next couple of years, you'll see a lot of these DAOs, a lot more tooling built being built out for these sort of communities, uh, a lot more participation, a lot more. Um, activism within the DAO is going to happen. And I think that, that that's really exciting. I, I, that, that's definitely piquing my interest on a personal side of the line. Well, I mean, for me, uh, I've been I've been asked when are we going to step into the NFT world? So <laughs> I have a good answer for that one. But uh, obviously, top of mind for a lot of a lot of folks. Um, but, I, but I do, I mean, joking aside, I think there is there is the, um, a very interesting proposition that's happening uh, in some of these emerging markets. When we speak about emerging markets, I think there's a there's also a divide that exists there with some with some countries that are could be labeled in an emerging market with very high GDP per capita. And I do see adoption in some of I see adoption of certain uh, blockchain uh, projects in general uh, taking in uh, taking up taking over in some of these markets that are emerging markets, and then in others that have a different GDP per capita that, um, uh, that are using a different angle or different value of what blockchain brings. So I think we will, what I would, I personally am very interested in, in, in seeing is how in these emerging markets, uh, these different blockchain kind of technologies and the meta metaverse and NFTs and all of this are actually taking up in which markets, um, are they accelerating in versus the others? Can you name a few of the markets? I mean, I would say I would say some of uh, some of the ones, let's say in the Middle East, for example, like the Saudi and UAE and maybe Qatar. I think you will see different kinds of blockchain applications there versus Egypt or versus Kenya versus, you know, looking at Latam could be Mexico and, and Brazil. So I think we'll start seeing uh, different uh, different adoption patterns. And um, uh, for me, just looking at the, this difference is, is going to be very telling. And uh, I'm just you know, keeping a close eye on that. Sure. Sounds like we've got the entire world covered through, through the three companies and Stellar. Uh, so, and hope that there's some co-creation together after this panel. But thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that panel and watch out for these three CEOs. Thank you. <laughs>